Rejoice and be glad in it. I am Reverend Donna Ives, and we are worshiping at the Spring Hill United Church of Christ. Some folks are here in the congregation, others are listening on their car radios in the parking lot, and still others will be watching this later on YouTube. Welcome to all. It's so good to be together in spirit. Chance and Reverend Jerry Jones and I are taking turns leading worship until we get an interim pastor. The interim search committee will be working on that very soon. Next, we need five people to serve on the profile committee. If you would like to serve on that, please contact Marty Hodgkins. And Larry will be writing more about that in this week's e-blast. Shannon has generously offered to head up a rummage sale, which will be held on November 7th, all outdoors. Many volunteers will be needed that day and the three days beforehand. Uh, so contact Shannon if you can help out with that. In fact, volunteer is the name of the game these days. We will be asking for volunteers for many things week after week, and please come forward and help out however you can. Please call the office Monday through Friday, 9 to 1, if you need pastoral care, and also to make a reservation for next week's service if you'd like to be here in Fellowship Hall. As always, your health and safety during this pandemic are of primary importance to us, and we appreciate your cooperation in following the rules set by the regathering team for the benefit of everyone. And finally, a reminder that our pledges and contributions are very important as we strive to move forward with the important work that goes on here. They'll be passing the basket out in the parking lot, and we have a plexiglass container in the back of the hall for your offerings here. So come, let us worship God. The light of God's love is in our hearts today and always. We come together as individuals to form a community and to celebrate and worship together. We join together today to covenant with God to promise to be instruments of God's love and peace. with mine in prayer. Tender and compassionate God, you ask us to pray for all people. We offer our prayers for our world in need, trusting in your great love. We pray for the Church of Jesus Christ around the world. As the broken bread, though once scattered, as grain on the hillsides became one loaf, so may your Church be one in spirit throughout the earth. We pray for those who govern every land. Turn the hearts of leaders and nations to you, that governments may seek the good of humanity. We pray for all who suffer, for those who are denied what they need to live, and those whose lives and dreams have been shattered by war and disease. We ask that you grant your peace to those who are sick and those who grieve. Radiate through their lives with the light of your presence, that renewed health and strength might be theirs. 
We pray to you, O oh God, for those whose actions offend us and for those we have learned to fear or despise. Through your great love, make tender all hearts hardened by hatred and suspicion and work for justice among us. And now let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. <laughs> should I forgive as many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. When he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him. And as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold, together with his wife and children and all his possessions, and payment to be made. 
So the slave fell on his knees before him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave, as he went out, came upon one of his fellow slaves, who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, Pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me, and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed, and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, You wicked slave, I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly Father will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. May God add his blessing to this reading of his holy word. What do we do when someone wrongs us, hurts us, betrays our trust? Our instinct is to get even. There was a man who went to see his doctor because he was feeling absolutely terrible. The doctor gave him a careful examination, left the room to look at some tests, and came back in with a very somber expression on his face and said, Sir, I don't know how to break the news to you, but you have rabies and you're going to die very soon. The man very calmly got out a piece of paper and began furiously writing. The doctor said, what are you doing, making out your will? He said, oh no, I'm writing out a list of people I'm going to bite. <laughs> <laughs> well, obviously, as Christians, retribution like that isn't what we're called to do. Forgiving is. But the ability to forgive is learned. It's not a natural instinct. And what is the best way to learn to forgive? Practice it. So what do we do about our frailties? We do what Christians have been doing since the beginning. We open the Bible and listen closely, especially to the Gospels. The early Christians had a tough road. They were pressured by Rome, by whatever culture they were living in, and by the Jews. This is one of the reasons the Gospels were written. One of the things Matthew wanted to do was to help the struggling church find its way through choppy waters. Those early believers were hungry for help on how they might create and sustain real community. So Matthew's Gospel provided direction to help the church maintain a meaningful fellowship in a hard time. What is the glue that holds this thing we call church together? What keeps us from too much division and conflict with those whose beliefs differ from our own? Today's lesson from Matthew gives us our answer. Peter had been listening to Jesus and he took those conversations to heart. He thought about the weak ones, the lost sheep who wandered away and got into trouble the ones he disagreed with, the ones who had hurt him. Then Peter came and said to him, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. Now the Jewish law said that you should forgive someone who hurts you three times. But Peter thought he was being very generous when he asked if seven times would be sufficient. That was more than going a second mile. 
But rather than being commended for being willing to be so forgiving, he was told that basically we are to forgive without limit. Matthew put this story in his document to help a very troubled church by saying, this is the only way you are going to survive. Some translations of the Bible read, not seven times, but I tell you, 70 times seven. Well, that totals up to 490 times. But it isn't about keeping score. Forgiveness is an attitude, a way of life. It's a matter of the heart. Matthew envisioned the Christian church as a kind of laboratory where we learn to forgive, the place where we hammer out these hard issues that divide us. Unfortunately, we haven't always done a good job of dealing with forgiveness and reconciliation. And if we can't do it as a church, how can we be an example to the world? What stands in our way of being forgiven? Is it someone who hurt you badly? That person could be dead, but the power of the hurt still lingers. Someone may have broken your heart, betrayed your trust, abused you, lied to you, caused you enormous emotional pain. Sure, we can forgive the small stuff, but some of us have been hurt in ways in which we will carry the scars the rest of our lives, and yet we are expected to forgive. So how do we do that with great difficulty? The bottom line, though, is that we forgive because God has first forgiven us. It's part of the Lord's Prayer. Forgive us our debts, or trespasses, or sins, as we forgive our debtors, those who trespass against us, those who sin against us. Different churches choose one of those three terms, but the important word is the little word, as. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. We know that God is gracious, merciful, and forgiving. But there is a caveat there. If we want to be forgiven, then we need to be a forgiving people. Distinguished child psychiatrist Dr. Robert Coles went to Biloxi, Mississippi in the 1950s to help black children living with the trauma of trying to integrate their schools. He worked with a little girl named Ruby, who would walk to school guarded by federal marshals who escorted her through an angry mob of protesters. Some of you can probably picture the famous Norman Rockwell painting of that little girl in a crisp white dress walking proudly to school, oblivious to the hostile mob around her. Dr. Coles was concerned about what effect all this hatred would have on the little girl, possibly for the rest of her life. As a psychiatrist, he knew that she was probably having trouble eating, sleeping, learning, going about her daily activities. And so every day when he interviewed her, he would ask, Ruby, how are you sleeping? Just fine. Coles would continue, are you able to sleep all right? Just fine. Every day he would ask the same questions, and every day she would reply, I'm just fine. Finally, one day he heard Ruby's teacher say that she had noticed that Ruby seemed to be talking to herself as she walked through that angry line. Dr. Coles asked her what she was saying as she was walking. She told him, I say, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. When we ask ourselves if we could forgive over and over again, it helps if we think like Ruby, that sometimes those who are hurting us in some way are oblivious to the harm they are causing. It helps if we remember that we too are sinners and that we too probably hurt people in ways that we don't even realize. And finally, when we wonder if we could forgive 490 times 
four, 77 times, seven times, or even just three, we have to remember how many times we are forgiven. How many times does God forgive us? And it helps to remember that by not forgiving, by carrying a grudge, we hurt ourselves. French author Victor Hugo has a short story titled 93. In the midst of this tale, a ship at sea is caught in a terrific storm. Buffeted by the waves, the boat rocks to and fro, when suddenly the crew hears a terrific crashing sound below deck. They know what it is. A cannon they are carrying has broken loose and is smashing into the ship's sides with every list of the ship. Two brave sailors, at the risk of their lives, manage to go below and fasten it again, for they know that the heavy cannon on the inside of their ship is more dangerous to them than the storm on the outside. And so it is with people. Problems within are often much more destructive to us than the problems without. Today's lesson takes us below decks to look inside ourselves concerning the whole matter of forgiveness. In my work as a chaplain, one of the saddest things to hear was that someone was estranged from family members. Sometimes a grudge about what they often couldn't remember had been nursed for decades. But now the person was seriously ill or about to undergo important surgery, and time was running out. Although it may be hard at the time, forgiveness is doing a favor to yourself. It is wonderful to live without regrets. Now, we all know that we have a lot of work ahead of us as a congregation. We have no sanctuary, no pastor, our financial situation is shaky, and we're dealing with a pandemic to boot. So, let us begin by forgiving each other for real or rumored offenses and forge ahead with the important work of Spring Hill United Church of Christ, keeping in mind how many times we have been forgiven by God and let us go and do likewise. Amen. Holy God, whose name is before all names, we worship you with our offerings. They represent our labor, 
our investment of time and energy. We want them to be put to the best possible use. May they provide bread for body and soul, that your people may be preserved and strengthened for ministry. Bless and multiply our efforts, we pray. And now let us return to our homes, but not to stay. Our pilgrimage is not complete. So come again, join us on our common journey, seeking always God's promised peace and sharing it with the world. Go in peace and come again in hope. Amen. Thank you.